Never trust a zombie. I when I look at the camera, it shows me reverse on the on the screen, but then on the video it's not reversed. Like I see the mirror image for some reason, but then it's flipped around again when you see it. So I made a comment in the last video I made about that, and then I watched it and it came out right. Anyway, I intended to do this yesterday, but I got wrapped up in doing something else. So chapter five, never trust a zombie, coming at you now. Chapter 5. Come out and play. I scoped the halls looking for Rachel. Both of them. The halls, I mean. There's only one Rachel. She isn't in the hall or by her locker, so I decided to pop into the classroom to see if she's there. She isn't, but the teacher is, and she engages me in conversation. I went to get out and watch the parking lot for Rachel until I realized how creepy that sounds and resigned to submit to conversation with Mrs. Davis. I have to give a report on everything I have done in my old school for the first half of the year. She seems impressed by the speed of our curriculum. Another student comes into the class and has a question for Mrs. Davis, which frees me up. After putting my backpack on the chair where I sat yesterday, I return to the hallway. Class doesn't start for 10, 10 more minutes. Still no sign of Rachel, but the Jansons and Michael are making their way down the hall. Trent says, where are you headed, Eric? Just wandering a bit. Still a lot of time before class starts, I reply. It's true. I am wandering. I have a purpose, but technically I am wandering as well. Don't be late for class, he says. Of course not. Wouldn't miss it for anything. Okay, now that is a lie. I would totally miss it, and regardless of the inflection in my voice and Trent's inability to understand dry wit, no teenager alive would mistake the sarcasm behind such an answer to that question. More specifically, however, I would miss class if the alternative was, was talking with Rachel some more. But first, I have to find her. I return to the parking lot to look for Rachel. A shiny VW Jetta pulls into the parking lot right after, right as I finish my scan of the perimeter. This car is unlike most of the other vehicles in the lot, which population consists primarily of I'm laughing at my writing. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm breaking narrative character because I'm laughing at my writing. I'm allowed to do that because I wrote it. You're allowed to do that too if you want because that's fine. It's whatever. It's all good. I apologize for the interruption. Let me restart the paragraph. If I can stop laughing. This is going to be a problem. Sometimes I get into these things where I start laughing at something and then I can't stop laughing at that thing. And then no matter how many times it comes back around again, I continue to laugh at it for the rest of my life. So this might be the end of me reading this book. I will never be able to read it without laughing again, and I don't even know why. All right. I returned to the – I was just thinking maybe I'll read with my eyes closed. That way I can focus and center myself. But then I immediately realized if I close my eyes, I can't see the words. At least I figured it out before I tried it. Back to the reading. I return to the parking lot to look for Rachel. A shiny VW Jetta pulls into the parking lot right as I finish my scan of the perimeter. This car is unlike most of the other vehicles in the lot, which population consists primarily of pickup trucks. I know that's a stereotype for this area of the country, but stereotypes are often based on reality, and this one certainly rings true. Other than the trucks, there are a lot of older cars, by which I mean the cars were built before their drivers were born, and that's including the teachers. The Jetta is recent and sparkly. Not a cheap car, I imagine. I don't know what the laws in Texas are regarding window tint, but in some of the places I've lived, this car would be illegal. Something inside me says it is Rachel's, probably just wishful thinking. I take to leaning against the wall of the school, a few feet from the front doors. The blue metal fleck car pulls into an empty spot. I wait for the driver to emerge from behind the seemingly mirrored windows. I try not to be conspicuous, but suddenly realize that I'm the only person outside the school at the moment. Starting to feel slightly embarrassed, I consider going back inside. Luckily, the driver's door opens, and there's Rachel, or it could be in a few more years. I was wrong a moment ago. There are two Rachels. This woman has the same hair and pale skin, roughly the same height, but slightly older looking. The passenger door opens and there is Rachel. This time I'm sure of it. The doppelganger must be her mom. She got a ride to school from her mom. Oh, Henry, my plan has backfired. Rachel got a ride to school and I walked. It's the gift of the Magi, more or less. Probably less. But here we stand, each of us with a car yesterday, neither of us with a car today, and, and her mom is with her. At least I don't have my mom with me, although I'm sure she'd love it. They're both walking towards me. I wave to Rachel, and her mom looks at her. She waves back. Her mom just smiles at me. You must be Eric, says Mrs. Sutton. Yes, I am. I guess you are Mrs. Sutton. Hi, Rachel. I use my best formal voice. I didn't in that case when I was reading it. Sorry. Hi, Eric. This is my mom, Dr. Arlene Sutton. Before I can correct myself and apologize for missing the title, Dr. Sutton says, Eric, I understand you were speaking with Rachel yesterday. Well, I came here today to tell you to stay away from her. The look on my face must have interrupted her fun, because the doctor's stern countenance shifts into a contorted smile. Some sort of giggle, almost a chortle, is let loose before she says, I'm sorry, I was just trying to have some fun with you. I'm not very good at keeping a straight face. 
Rachel rolls her eyes. I told her not to do it, but she insisted. She always likes to embarrass me, or at least try to. I'm used to it now, and I expect it whenever she meets my friends, meets someone new, so I don't really let myself be bothered by it. She ruins all of my fun, Dr. Sutton says. I'm surprised by the doctor, not because of her failure at keeping up her tease on me, but just in general. She doesn't seem as reserved as Rachel did yesterday. I suppose her behavior could be identified as strange, like Trent said, but it isn't the kind of strange that turns you off of someone. Of course, it is way too early to make that sort of judgment. People often do have a side of themselves that they keep hidden. I learned that one from Billy Joel. Here I stand, facing Rachel and her mother, who she looks exactly like, with nothing coming to mind to say. You had me going, Dr. Sutton, I say in hopes of initiating, initiating conversation, but neither of them pick it up or make a movement toward the, towards the door, I ask. So what brings you to school today? Rachel didn't tell you? Dr. Sutton, Sutton looks at Rachel with mock disbelief. The sixth grade is having a science fair, and as a scientist, I've been invited to be a judge and speaker for the event. Oh, that's cool. What kind of science do you do? I ask and then wonder about my phrasing. Is that an appropriate way to ask that question? Maybe it should be. Uh, maybe it should be what kind of practice are you in? I don't know. I'll think about that later. Before we left Atlanta, I was working with the CDC. Specifically, I was in virus research. Wow, I'm terrible at reading. <laughs> the flow is, I just can't do it. Before we left Atlanta, I was working with the CDC, comma, specifically I was in virus research. Some uh, <laughs> something changes in her voice. I'm not a psychological expert, but if I were on TV, I'd probably be drawing some conclusions about the change. As it is, I notice that her voice seems to waver a bit, but I just don't know what that means. I recall Rachel acting similarly, similarly, similarly yesterday when she said something, but I don't remember what it was now. Best keep the conversation going. Wow, are you working here in Cranston or do you commute? I ask. I'm not officially working anymore. I still keep contact with the CDC and consult on some things, but for the most part, I'm sort of retired from that world. Again, a little uneasiness, but this time I think there's enough to actually draw a conclusion. Regret. That makes sense. A scientist working with the CDC in Atlanta who has to quit her job to move to Cranston population in significant Texas would likely be a little resentful. I wonder if that's how it went down or if I'm just making things up. Oh, I hope you don't mind with that. I hope you don't mind that I asked. I was just curious. I say apologetically. I'm not offended. When it came time to leave, I was ready to do so. Right, Rachel? Right, Mom, Rachel says. and seems to take on some of the regret seeping into the tone of the conversation. Maybe I shouldn't have said, right, Mom. I should have said, right, Mom. There you go. That's more regretful. Looking to change the subject, I ask, how does the science fair work? Is there a school-wide display of projects or something? Rachel responds first. They'll be taking over the gym after we have our class. When we go to lunch, they'll have an assembly for the elementary grades with my mom as the speaker. After that, the sixth graders will present their projects to everyone. It's not one of those events where each kid has a table and a poster board set up. It's not one of those events. Okay. That sounds good. But we don't get to miss any class time to see it, huh? I ask. Dr. Sutton laughs. Spoken like a true high school student. Anything to get out of class. I smile and think, duh. But my polite upbringing has been too influential for me to say something like that. At least not to the mother of the girl I've got an irrational infatuation with. I only call it irrational because I don't know much about her yet. We just met, and I've been practically stalking her this morning. As I focus my attention on the matter, I wonder if I should ignore I wonder if I should ignore Rachel for a bit. Nah. You two better get to class. School's about to start, right? Dr. Sutton says. Spoken like a true parent of a high school student, Rachel says. We all laugh and start towards the door. Inside, Dr. Sutton says goodbye and heads to the right. Rachel and I head left. Nice car, I say. You were watching for me? Rachel says. I mean, were you watching for me? I like what you did there with the rewording. That's subtle. But remember, I have a keen sense of perception, I say. And I have a keen sense of you not answering my question, she says as she walks a bit faster away from me. Once again, the school is small, so there's only a few more steps to her locker where she stops. Okay, I'll admit it. I was watching for you. The easiness I feel in talking with Rachel is back, just like yesterday. I don't think I've ever experienced this before. I didn't expect you to get out of that sorority sister car. I figured you'd drive something more befitting a rancher's daughter. I don't know where I'm going with this. You mean like a pickup truck or like a horse? She has the locker open and pauses while reaching for a book to look at me and wait for my answer. I say in all seriousness, I mean like a private helicopter. This time it is a chortle, which means with her mom earlier it was definitely a giggle. Sometimes you just need to hear a chortle to appropriately calibrate your ability to define it. Rachel says, you should teach the straight face delivery method to my mom. As you saw, she hasn't gotten it down yet. As for the helicopter, I don't know how ranchers in Chicago do it, but down here we stick to cars for travel around town. Besides, one of the horses has the helicopter today. It is a cheesy joke, but I like it. It's pretty much on par for anything I'll come up with. I'm quickly running out of time to discuss lunch plans. We aren't alone. The hallway is full of students, as full as the school can be. 
but no one else is involved in conversation with us. So now is my time. I walked to school again today. I walked to school today, so I'm eating lunch at the cafeteria again. I told Trent and the gang that I'd eat with them. So if you aren't leaving for lunch, will you want to sit with us? Rachel looks at me, smirks, and then says, "I'd like to eat lunch with you." It seems like one of those moments where a sentence is left hanging and build up for a but. So I intervene, but not with them. You said it, not me. She replies, "I can handle sitting with them occasionally, but." She leans in and lowers her voice a bit. They all just strike me as insincere and immature, and I tire of their antics really quickly. She straightens up and flashes a quick smile. I hear you. Some of us are just more mature. Old beyond our years, right? Sit with us today, and then tomorrow we'll do something else. How's that sound? Sound, I ask. What will we, what will we do tomorrow? Rachel asks. She caught me. Uh, I don't know. Something else? I just mean you and I can have lunch, and I won't make plans to go or sit with the others. I don't want to interfere with your friends, Eric. You met them before you met me and seemed to get along fine with them. I don't want to impose my personality clashes with them onto you. I met them merely hours before I met you. Besides, you and I are outsiders. We need to stick together. I don't want to turn into one of them. If they are like you said, they're all part of some small town cult-like community. Maybe not cult-like, but zombies or something. Drones that don't think for themselves. From the look on Rachel's face when I say this, I think for sure that Trent, Michael, Jesse, and Chrissy are all standing right behind me. But she isn't looking past me. She's still keeping eye contact. I casually turn and look around to see if it seems like anyone heard me. There's no indication of it. Yeah, you're right, she says, relaxing from the shock of a moment before. You and I are outsiders. We don't want to become part of the drone population. If it were possible, I'd say the color drained from her face after I said that last part. But she's so pale already. In any case, you smell better than Trent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I decide that my communication skills are going through some sort of changes, like when my voice cracked a few years ago. Oh, that's good. I, I, so I wrote that intentionally. That's good. Uh, sometimes the awkward things slip out or don't sound how I intended them in my mind after I say them. I hope this is just a phase I'm passing through. You can smell me? Rachel's brow wrinkles a bit. That's not what I meant, and no, actually, but I can smell Trent. Can you smell him now? Rachel's getting playful again. I laugh a little. Well, no, not right now, but I smelled him yesterday. <laughs> Rachel interrupts me. You did? <laughs> I hold up a hand, indicating I need a moment. I think I did that yesterday, too. Maybe I need to slow down. I compose my thoughts and deliver as eloquent an explanation as I can. Given the socially appropriate physical proximity for holding a conversation, I was within smelling distance of Trent after gym class yesterday and noticed a slightly unpleasant odor emanating from his person. Only slightly unpleasant. I laughed and gave up. Give me a break. All right, all right. Well played, sir. She says and closes the locker door. In a moment of great synchronicity, the class bell rings, so we scurry inside the classroom to take our seats. They have two bells before first period, one for a 30-second warning and another to signify the start of class. They don't have homeroom here. Any announcements just come through in the first five minutes of class. I guess it really is a homeroom, technically, because first period is five minutes longer than the other ones. But announcements in the Pledge of Allegiance don't take five minutes, so I guess first period classes are just longer than the others over the long run. Anyway, Rachel and I weren't the last ones through the door after the warning bell, but it was after the bell that we walked in, so people were looking towards the door. A conditioned response, I suppose, and Jesse seemed to take notice of how we walked it together. As she had secured the seat for me the day before, and I didn't want to break from that new pattern, I reserved the seat next to Jesse with my backpack earlier. Rachel took an empty chair in the front of the class, right by the door, similar to the location she occupied in the two classes I had with her yesterday. I suppose that's her regular seating preference. When I sat down on Jesse's left, she turned fully towards me and made a cooing sound and paced to accompany it. I played dumb and just shrugged. From my peripheral field of vision, I could see that Jesse raised an eyebrow and pursed her lips, then shifted in her seat to look forward again. First period continued on like any other day of class. We had three minutes in between classes. Rachel took a similar front of the room seat in this class, and I'm once again sitting where I sat yesterday. Today we are watching a video about glaciers. But rather than pay attention, I'm replaying my conversation with Rachel from before first period for about the tenth time since it happened. We didn't chat at all during the room change. I suppose it will be lunch before we talk again, depending on what she does at gym. She seems fine to me. I guess she's more fully recovered, but I don't know if she'll play hockey or not. I'll be in the first game, for sure, to run the tiebreaker. Maybe I'll be able to figure out a way to sit with her while I'm not playing. A way that won't bring obnoxious comments or looks from Jesse. But I'm starting to think that might not be possible. Of course, I may be letting Rachel's bias influence me. That would be unfair, but at the same time, I don't owe Jesse anything, and I'm not being rude to her, even if I'm starting to think she is somewhat obnoxious. There's just a lot of guesswork right now, because I don't know anyone very well. I jumped right into these two separate friendship dynamics, and both are unfamiliar to me. I should be able to fill in more of the gaps at lunch today with all of them together. 
At the least, it will be awkward for everyone and should lead to each side telling me more of the backstory later on. It might even get interesting. But before I get there, I have to endure the glacial melt and a few games of floor hockey, which isn't all that bad. I'm also interested to see if the cafeteria can redeem itself after yesterday's offering. I can't see how they could do any worse. My team won the tiebreaker, but then lost the next game, stalling us in the bracket, at least for the day. More important to mention is that Rachel didn't go to gym today. I caught her at her locker after second period, and she said she was still excused from gym class. She said since she, <clears throat> she said since she was still excused from gym class, she was going to help her mom with some stuff in preparation for the science fair assembly. Something about a laptop, projector, and PowerPoint slideshow. But she'd catch up with me in the cafeteria for lunch. It now being lunch, I'm sitting at a table in the cafeteria waiting for her. Everyone else is up in the food line, but I decided to wait for Rachel before getting my lunch. I'm actually pretty hungry. I hope she gets here soon. There she is. My face involuntarily lights up, kind of like the moment in the movies when the nerd girl walks into the room after her magical transformation, which usually consists of taking off the glasses and putting her hair up. Big transformation. Anyway, Rachel's entrance catches my attention. I wave and shout her name. Too loudly, I suppose, as everyone looks over at me. She doesn't seem to mind. Hi, Eric. She says as she makes her way to the table. She sits down next to me, placing her backpack on the table in front of herself. Did you get things set up with your mom all right? I think I worded that poorly. Yeah, she's all ready to go. They'll be setting up right now, and then the kids will be brought in after a few minutes, she says. Sweet. Too bad we can't go see it, I say. Rachel says, I actually was able to participate last year. It wasn't that great. But if you just want to miss class, then I guess it's worth it. Hmm. Oh, well. It's only my second day of classes here. I guess I don't need to be trying to get out of them already. Do you want to grab something to eat? I'm not actually very hungry. I had a good breakfast, Rachel says. Are you sure? You don't want anything at all? I can get you something. I offer. Thank you, but no, I'm all set. She takes her water bottle from her backpack. <clears throat> okay, they all want to eat outside. I was just sitting here waiting for you. Do you, want me to, do you want to head out and meet up with them or wait for me? Rachel smiles and takes a drink of water. I'll give you two chances to guess it. There are only two options to choose between, so that doesn't sound like much of a challenge, I say. Well, she asks. My guess is you'll be waiting here for me. Rachel winks at me and recaps her water bottle. I'll be right back. I pass Trent on my way to the lunch line as he heads towards the outside door. We'll be out in a minute, Trent, I say. He looks at Rachel sitting alone at the table and then back to me and smiles. Cool. My weight, my weight has allowed the crazy lunch rush to work its way through before me. All of a dozen or so people have come through. I don't know how they keep up with the volume. <sighs> my delivery is terrible. I don't know how they keep up with the volume. Chicken nuggets and mashed potatoes for lunch today. This is one school lunch that I've never been disappointed by. When I turn around after paying for lunch, I look at Rachel. Our eyes meet and we maintain the gaze. I start walking towards her and become aware of a sensation of anxiety at the possibility of tripping over something. So my stride shortens and my pace relaxes. I don't want to look away, so I try to prevent falling by adapting my locomotion. It isn't a far walk, so I'm at the table pretty quickly. Rachel stands up, shoulders her backpack, and then reaches for mine, which is resting on the floor. Let me carry this for you, she says. Thank you. We exit the lunchroom. It certainly is a nice day out. Jesse made a good call for eating outside. At the picnic table, the group secured. Michael is recounting some jokes he heard on TV last night. Rachel and I sit down next to each other on the side with Michael. Trent and Jesse are sitting opposite us. I start in on my lunch. Michael finishes his monologue, and everyone is quiet for a minute while we eat. Jesse asks Rachel about the science fair, and Rachel answers her questions. Trent and Michael start discussing basketball practice, and Jesse drifts into their, drift, drifts into their conversation. Rachel and I start our own conversation. I wish we were alone. How'd your team do in gym? Rachel asks. Of course, I'm absolutely pleased that she's asking about this, something that has nothing to do with her. It shows, shows, I'm having a real trouble with alliteration, reading, not doing well. It shows she is concerned with me. Either that, either that or she takes gym class floor hockey spectatorship very seriously. We won the tiebreaker, but lost the next game. I enjoyed it. I even scored a goal. Well, good for you, Rachel says. Yeah, he carried his whole team, scored the only goal. Michael joins the conversation, to our surprise and my dismay. I'm a covert hockey star, I say. Too bad we're in Texas and not Canada. Maybe you'd have found your calling in life, says Trent. I guess everyone is in on the conversation now. Right. My calling in life is indoor gym class floor hockey. I decide not to hide my disdain for the praise of sports achievement. I think Trent understands me this time. He says, just remember you said you'll come out for baseball. I did say that. I will try it, but no promises of making the cut, I confess. Rachel asks, you play baseball? Not exactly. I enjoy it more than some other sports, but I don't really play. Do you have a favorite pro team? I've always been a Braves fan, supporting my hometown, she says. Trent and Michael go back to their own discussion. Jesse has flagged down one of her other friends, and they are talking. And they are talking. My dad took me to some games when we were living in San Diego. Other than that, I haven't really ever played any 
ever followed any pro sports, so maybe I would vote for the Padres, I say. I recommend the Braves. You should think about changing your preference. I'll take it into consideration. So what time is your mom done with the science fair? Does it last after school is out? I ask. It's done when school is done. Nothing extra. Why? Rachel asks. Not willing to give my real reason, I only say, I was just wondering if you were going to have to wait around for her after school, that's all. But that's not all. I want to know if I'll be able to spend time, some time with her after school. Of course, I didn't drive today, so I can't offer her a ride home. And she's with her mom, so she probably won't, won't offer me a ride home. Or if she does, it won't quite be the same. Do you have after school plans? She asks. Me? No, I just, no, I just have homework, I guess. Oh, she says. It's on me now. Time to ask the question, make a plan. Do you have anything planned for tonight? I ask through restricted vocal cords due to nervousness. Tonight? No. Homework also, I suppose, Rachel says. Maybe the two of you should do homework together, Jesse suggests. I forgot the others are still here, or at least I'm pretending to forget. Now I wish they weren't. I don't like this type of interference. Rachel doesn't look at Jesse, at least not right away. I do, though. Maybe we should, I say. I can't tell for sure what is being expressed in Jesse's face, either jealousy or contempt. I don't know if one would really be better than the other right now, and I'm not sure who the feeling is directed towards, me or Rachel. Speaking of homework, Rachel begins, I need to see Mr. Owen about an assignment I missed last week. I'll catch up with you in a bit, or see you next period. And with that, she stands up to leave. Oh, okay. I'm not done eating yet, otherwise I would just follow her, but I don't want to seem too zealous. I'll be here, I guess, until next period. I'll see you here or there. Bye, Eric. Rachel doesn't even acknowledge the others sitting around the table. I watch her enter the cafeteria before rotating back to face the table. I deliberately look at my food so as to avoid making eye contact with the others. Silence ensues while I eat my chicken nuggets. Soon Trent says, I told you she was kind of strange. Right when the talk turned towards you and her doing something outside of school, just like I said, surprisingly. <clears throat> wow, okay. Trent says, I told you she was kind of strange. Right when the talk turned towards you and her doing something outside of school, just like I said. Surprisingly, he doesn't sound arrogant about it, only observational. Jesse isn't so observational. Rachel is nice enough to talk to, but you don't want to hang out with her, Eric. She's very weird. Before Michael can add his two cents, I better start a rebuttal. What's so strange? I don't see it. I think some awkwardness exists between you guys and her, and that's all it is. I don't know why that awkwardness exists, but it wasn't until you said something, Jesse, that she just left. So maybe she feels the same way about you that you feel about her. Jesse's mouth sort of drops open, but she recovers quickly. Trent comes to his sister's defense. I'd say you were right, Eric, except for my experience with Rachel proves otherwise, and how she acted with other people who tried to get close to her. Be friends with whoever you want, Eric. I don't care. I'm just trying to save you some hassle is all. Jessie gathers her things, and she and her friend she and her friend leave. I'm sorry if I offended you, but I don't think there's anything wrong with Rachel, I say as Jessie walks away. I make eye contact with Trent and Michael alternately. Michael smiles and shrugs and finishes off his chocolate milk. Trent says, maybe things are different with Rachel now. Maybe she just doesn't like the local guys. Jessie's got a crush on you, but don't let it get to your head. <clears throat> she hasn't found any guys around here that she's too keen on, so anyone new is likely to spark her interest. Don't sweat her. Rather than damage the re remaining bonds of friendship I might have with these guys, I say, thanks, I won't worry about it. I really wasn't trying to make Jesse upset. I just felt like Rachel should be defended, seeing as how she wasn't here to do it for herself. Trent nods and raises his bottle of juice and salute to me. <laughs> Whatever differences exist between me and Trent, I like him. He's got a cool attitude, perhaps a little slow on the uptake with sarcasm, but that's not really a bad thing. So far, I can see he is loyal, takes care of his family, and is outgoing in the friendship department. I think I'll pump him for information now. I appreciate your experience with Rachel, but the claim that she and her family are super strange seems kind of strange to me. I don't see it. I don't want to get into gossip or rumors, but is there anything specific that you can tell me about her? And why are they, why they, and about why they are the strange Suttons? I ask. All right, Eric, I'll explain a few things, but I guess it really is just rumor and gossip. You know how small towns are. Trent starts in. I'm not sure if he's asking me a question or making a statement, or perhaps it's a rhetorical question. He's still looking at me and not talking, so I guess I better give an answer. This is the smallest town I've ever lived in, so all I know about them is likely stereotyping from TV and stuff, I answer. Well, that's all probably pretty accurate as to how it really is. We are tight, and when outsiders come in, they don't understand the heritage. They have a different lifestyle, and the feelings of strangeness go back and forth, you know? Well, I'll just tell you from the start. When the Suttons arrived in Cranston, they came with the story that they were returning to their family heritage. But there were still some folks in town who were here when the original Suttons were around. Small town, everyone knows everyone, or everyone knows someone's grandfather. So there were some questions, but it's not easy to go up to someone and say, you aren't who you say you are, so it just gets talked about in the background. And we talked about it in the background. I guess it didn't help that the previous owners of the Sutton's house had taken on the business of undertaking. So Rachel's house used to be a funeral parlor. You can guess how the fact that factors into the rumors. 
I don't know if I have time to finish reading this. I read faster. We all chuckle a bit as we contemplate how ridiculous we are. I guess that's what we chuckle at. Trent continues his story. The Suttons are claiming a heritage that is in question. They move into a funeral home, and then no one ever seems to see da Rachel's dad anywhere except at work. And her mom is some important scientist that just up and quit and moved to Cranston. Sounds funny, I guess. Rachel was great when she, when she moved here. We were pretty excited to have a new girl around, a hot new girl. Trent looks to Michael for affirmation. Michael shrugs. Rachel and I struck up a conversation quickly, not unlike your experience with her. Maybe not quite as fast. After a week or two, I don't remember now, I asked her to go to a movie with me. She said yes at first, but then the next day she was kind of off with me. Then the day after that, she barely spoke with me except to say she couldn't go to the movie with me. I asked why, but she, <clears throat> I asked why, but she never had a good reason, just that she didn't have time or something like that. It was lame, whatever it was, but we went from starting a friendship to being barely even friendly classmates. She never comes to school activities or sporting events. We never see her around town. So I guess the rumor started to fill in the blanks about what she's doing outside of school. We didn't figure she was working for her dad. The people in town who do work for him could have confirmed that, but that'd be weird for anyone to ask about. Not sure why I thought of it now. Anyway, I guess it was just the family heritage question and then the antisocial behavior that led to the rumors. I think Rachel is a nice girl. She never attempts to defend her family against the rumors, so that seems to give validity to it all. I interject. Or she sees it as pointless to refute the rumors because they are just rumors. Also, I think you mean asocial, not antisocial. Just one of those things that kind of bothered me. I learned about it in school last year. Antisocial means something specific, like being opposed to society. Asocial means what people usually think antisocial means, which is to be less enthusiastic about social gatherings, kind of like introversion, I guess. Nah, introversion isn't about being in groups. Restart. Nah, introversion isn't about not being in groups. It's more about preferring to spend time alone to re-energize and relax. Introverts can do big groups, but they usually don't like to do it for very long, Michael says, somewhat to our astonishment, which he must be able to read on our faces. I read a book about it. I guess I'm kind of an introvert myself. Trent looks at Michael, strangely, and slowly turns back to face me and says, okay, so asocial. I'll remember that. I smile sheepishly. I think the different terms should be used correctly, but I always feel kind of pedantic when I correct people on it. Antisocial is so widely misused that it can probably be used legitimately in both cases. I'm sorry, I say. I didn't mean to turn this into a discussion of grammar and social psychology. It's cool. I like learning, says Michael. Yeah, it's a good diversion from the topic. But I just want to say that I don't mean to influence you against Rachel. I just don't want to see you have the same experience I did. But you aren't me, so who knows what might happen. Hopefully good things for you both. Thanks, Trent. I hope so too, I say. We sit in silence for the few remaining minutes of lunch period. Rachel never returns. I take the bull by the horns in the next class and move seats from yesterday so that I can sit next to Rachel. She doesn't seem to mind. I ask her about the assignment she had gone off to find out about. She explains what it, what it is and that it isn't a big deal. I am careful not to bring up lunch, the Jansons, or spending time together. Not that I don't want to further a conversation and make a plan of some kind, but I think it is best to wait for a more opportune time. That comes after final period. I walk with Rachel to her locker. We aren't alone, but it doesn't seem like anyone is actively taking an interest in our conversation this time. So do you want to do homework together sometime? I ask. Rachel doesn't stop transferring books from bag to locker. Yeah, I guess so. Ask a general question, get a general answer. I clarify. How about tonight? She asks back. How about it? She closes the locker door and looks at me and then asks, do you need to stop by your locker? Her question implies that she is willing to go with me if I have to. I like that. I don't think I need to go to the locker, but I'm going to go anyway. Yeah, I think I do. Okay, where is it? She asks. Just around the corner. I point. I suppose there's some sister system. I suppose there's some system to locker assignment, as in grouping by grade, but it is hard to tell. There aren't very many of them, and the lockers are assigned in seventh grade, and the same locker is kept through graduation, so the different grade areas sort of shift each year, and then there are newcomers like Rachel and me, who get assigned an empty locker, not necessarily part of our grades area. We, uh, we talked to the locker. We talked to We walked in. <laughs> I think I probably should have written put a in not necessarily wait who, who get assigned an empty locker not necessarily in part of our grades area perhaps i missed a word there <clears throat> page 77 maybe i missed a word we walk to the locker and as it isn't a very far walk and the hallway is still relatively congested congested we don't say a word as i begin to spin the dial for the combination lock she asks again so how about it tonight do you want to do homework together you can come over to my house you can stay for dinner if you want and i can drive you home I shuffle a few books to make it look like I really did need to come to the locker. That sounds good. Tonight, I mean. I don't know about dinner, though. I should probably not be out too long. The assignment I need to make up is going to require a lot of writing, which means typing, which will be easier if I'm at my house. I flash back to Trent's warnings. She isn't brushing me off completely, but she is limiting the plan. 
I shouldn't let that stuff get in my mind. Okay, great. I don't want to interfere with your other stuff. Would you rather come over after dinner then? I could pick, I could come pick you up whenever. I say, no, before dinner would probably be better. Then I could have the rest of the evening to work on a paper. It might keep me up late, she explains. She does have a legitimate reason for limiting the time she spends with me tonight. Cool. So we could just go to my house now then, I ask. Sure, I just need to tell my mom, Rachel says. Here's where I remember I didn't drive to school today. Oh, I just remembered. I walked to school today. Oh, okay. We could walk to your house or my mom could drive us, Rachel suggests. How about we walk? It seems nice enough out there. Not too hot, and it isn't a bad walk. I survived it this morning, so I should be able to handle it again. Unless you'd rather catch a ride, that's cool too. I need to be more decisive. I don't mind walking, but if my mom will need to pick me up later, then she might want to see where your house is. She'll offer to drive us either way, really. I can drive you home later. I have access to a car. I just wanted to walk today instead, I say. Okay, well, let's walk then. First, we just need to find mom so I can tell her, she says. We find Dr. Sutton in the gym talking to one of the science teachers. She sees us walking over and ends the conversation. The science teacher smiles at us and walks away. When we get close, Dr. Sutton says, Hey, kids, how was school? Same as usual, Rachel reports. I had a good day, I say, and then ask, How did the science fair go? It went really well. We get a lot of repeat projects from year to year. The standard fair of volcanoes and whatnot, but it's always a good time. Thanks for asking. Arlene Sutton is a very friendly and upbeat woman. My mom is kind of like that too, but in a more reserved way. What I mean is that you can read it on Dr. Sutton's face more easily than with my mom. Dr. Sutton is more expressive, I guess. So, Mom, Eric invited me over to his house to do homework. We were thinking I could go with him now, and then he could drive me home in time for dinner. I have a paper I missed last week that I'll need to do later this evening. Is it all right if I go with him? Rachel asks. Dr. Sutton's excitement from a moment before morphs into a look of concern. She seems like she is considering a very important question. Trent's words fill my mind again, and I begin wondering if maybe Rachel's parents are part of the reason why she seems to not want to spend time with anyone outside of school. I didn't think Rachel's question would be so difficult to consider. That sounds okay. You'll be home by six? Dr. Sutton asks her daughter. Yes, Rachel promptly replies. Then to me, Dr. Sutton asks, will your parents be home, Eric? A little surprised by the question I answer, my parents? Yeah, my mom is always home. I don't know when my dad will be home tonight. He works crazy hours most of the time. Dr. Sutton looks back to Rachel and finishes deliberating. Okay, if you're home by six, let me just gather my things and I'll be ready to go. We decided to walk to Eric's house, Rachel says. I walked to school today, but I will be able to drive Rachel home later by six, I say. Are you sure you wouldn't like a ride? Where do you live, Eric? Is it far? Dr. Sutton asks. Rachel answers his first question before I can take on the second. We're fine walking, Mom. Thanks for the offer. We live on Earp Street. It's off of First Street on the other side of Maine, I add. Yes, I know where that is. Okay, well, you two have fun. I guess I'll just head home now. Eric, it has been great meeting you. See you at home, Rachel. Nice to meet you too, Dr. Sutton, I say. Bye, Mom, Rachel says. Dr. Sutton gives a sort of slight informal bow and then walks across the gym. I turn to Rachel. Shall we? Let's, she replies. This time we exit the scene together. It's the end of chapter five. And I'm looking at the title of chapter six, and I don't remember that one. Huh. There's a pattern. There's a pattern to this to the chapter titles. I almost gave it away right then, but there's a pattern to the chapter titles. They mean something. There's significance to them. Tell me what it is. And I'll send you this when I'm done reading it, if you want this. I'll write my name in it with my hand. People like when you write your name on stuff that you made. Some people do. Um, anyway, all right. Well, that was Chapter 5. And uh, I'll, get, I'll try to be back on Tuesday for next week, Chapter 6. Yesterday, I just had stuff going on. I didn't get to – I didn't read beforehand. So, all right. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you.